Welcome to the context behind the crisis. I'm Seth Green, the Dean of the Graham School here at the University of Chicago. Over the next 50 minutes, we will explore the historical and political context behind the invasion of Ukraine with Faith Hillis, Professor of Russian History, and Monica Nalepa, Associate Professor of Political Science. As we begin, I wanna offer a few introductory comments. First, I want to acknowledge that we are having today's conversation during a deeply unsettling time in our world. As the New York Times has reported, the Russian invasion of Ukraine represents Europe's largest ground war since World War II. Thousands have died and more than 1 million people are now believed to be refugees. Yesterday's fire at Europe's largest nuclear power plant in Ukraine offers ominous signs of just how catastrophic this war could be. As my colleagues, Michelle Rasmussen and Nick Siemens have powerfully shared in a message to the university community yesterday, and I quote, we continue to watch the ongoing invasion of Ukraine with anguish and sorrow, and our thoughts and sympathies are with those in Ukraine and elsewhere who have been affected by the suffering, violence, and loss of life that the invasion has caused. We are putting in the chat their full statement which includes resources for the University of Chicago community, including gathering spaces, events, and counseling. Second, I wanna offer you a brief roadmap of today's event. After introducing our speakers, I have a number of questions that I'll ask, and then we anticipate coming to your questions around 11.30 a.m. Please share your questions in the Q&A throughout this event, and we will do our best to get to them. We do have over 3,000 registered for today's event, so we may not get to every question, but we will absolutely do our best. Finally, I wanna welcome you on behalf of the Graham School. We are the University of Chicago's home for lifelong learning, and we offer transformative education for learners at all ages and stages who seek to better understand our world and live examined lives of purpose, a goal that seems all too relevant in this moment. Our discussion today is featuring two University of Chicago faculty who teach in our school's Master of Liberal Arts, and we're deeply grateful for their time and their willingness to miss what we know has been an overwhelming few weeks in their lives. And with that, let me briefly introduce our speakers and we'll put in the chat a link to the event with their full and very impressive biographies. Faith Hillis is Professor of Russian History in the College at the University of Chicago a historian of modern Russia with a special interest in 19th and 20th century politics, culture, and ideas. Her work explores how Russia's political institutions and status as a multi-ethnic empire shaped public opinion and political cultures. Her most recent book, Utopia's Discontents, Russian Exiles and the Quest for Freedom, 1830 to 1930, was published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Phyllis received her PhD from Yale University. Monica Nalepa is an associate professor of political science at the University of Chicago with a focus on post-communist Europe. Her research interests include transitional justice, parties and legislatures, and game theoretic approaches to comparative politics. Her first book, Skeletons in the Closet, was published in the Cambridge Studies in Comparative Politics series and received multiple awards from the American Political Science Association. Her next book, After Authoritarianism, Transitional Justice and Democratic Stability, is coming out with Cambridge University Press this year. She received her PhD from Columbia University. Professor Hillis, I'd like to start with you. Putin invoked history in his February 21st speech, questioning Ukrainian statehood that immediately preceded the invasion. So I thought it was important to start there. Can you offer the audience a snapshot of the historical context of Russia and Ukraine? Right, I, I can, and as I'm going to explain, it's a long and complicated history. But before I get into that, I actually want to say something that I don't think I've ever said in my career as a historian, and that is that Putin is framing this as all about history, and he's framing history as the reason for the war. And I have to say that actually history is not in any of the top reasons why we're having the war right now. It's, it's, it's backdrop, right? But it's not the reason. And the reason we have a war right now, I think, is because Putin can't abide Ukrainians' right to sovereignty and their ability to make domestic and foreign policy as they see fit. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Um, however, I do think that history can help us explain where Putin is coming from and why he's obsessed with Ukraine. 
Um, Ukraine is really important in Putin's vision because it's been a fulcrum of Russian history and it's often determined the, the future of Russia itself. Um, so many people now have discovered that when both Russians and Ukrainians look to the origins of their state, they look to Kiev in the ninth century. Uh, but this history of entanglement and of Ukraine playing a really important role in determining the future of Russia runs throughout the centuries. So for example, in the early modern period, uh, Kiev was the center of the Orthodox world and it was the site of all the major academies that trained Orthodox priests. It was the site of all the printing presses that produced religious literature. And it produced a man named Fyodor Parakopovich who actually went on to become the ideologist of Peter the Great and the Russian empire. In the Soviet period, Ukraine produced communist leaders, including Trotsky, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev. It produced a disproportionate number of cultural figures and was the main center of Soviet agriculture, as well as heavy industry and defense. But at the same time, Ukraine has also produced the most aggressive and successful challenges to Russian imperialism and also to the Soviet project. And so we see this beginning in the 19th century with a sort of Ukrainian national project. In the 20th century, Ukraine was a site of vehement resistance to Soviet rule. Uh, this ran the gamut from peasant revolts against collectivization to a full-fledged uh, effort by nationalist militias who waged open war with the Soviet regime until the early 1950s. And so I think looking at this history in which Ukraine has both shaped Russia and the Soviet Union and everything they became, and also undermined those projects at times, I think he sees um, Ukraine as a, as a, as a central um, uh, determinant of Russia's own future. And the truth is that now, you know, Ukraine has developed a vital civil society, and it has also risen up to challenge Russian hegemony, as my colleague will speak to in a minute, three times in the last 20 years. And so I think what is at stake for Putin is that he believes if Ukraine succeeds, then his regime of autocracy um, and, and, and imperialism will, will fail. So I want to um, segue to the moments that you just mentioned, because uh, Professor Nalepa, you explore the development of political regimes and you've explored the current government of Ukraine. Uh, can you pick up where Professor Hillis left off and talk about the Orange Revolution and the Revolution of Dignity and how those inform the government that leads to Ukraine today? Yeah, I'm, I might even start a little bit earlier with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Or, um, or even the collapse of the Soviet bloc, which uh, started in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, actually not with, um, with, with, with republics gaining independence, but with um, uh, several uh, socialist countries from the, the Soviet bloc, um, just uh, turning away from communist ideology, uh, largely using um, uh, the fact that the, the Soviet Union just did not have the capacity to, to intervene in their independence movements like it did in 1956 in Budapest in 1968 uh, in Prague uh, or, you know, or in 1981 almost in, in Poland. Um, so, uh, so, so Ukraine was one of those republics that gained independence uh, alongside uh, Belarus, the Baltic states, Georgia and numerous others. Um, and at first, uh, as was common actually for many, not just former Soviet republics, but, just, but even, uh, but even uh, former uh, socialist states, uh, the government was actually in control of the, the successors of uh, the Communist Party. So, uh, so it was under um, the, the rule of, of Kuchma, who was, um, uh, who, who was perceived as quite a corrupt politician with ties to, uh, uh, to Russia. And uh, following his uh, very unpopular two terms in government, he had actually uh, designated a successor uh, in the uh, in the form of uh, uh, Yanukovych, um, who uh, was standing uh, against uh, Viktor Yushchenko in a in a, a presidential race. And that presidential race, this is this is 2004 now, uh, was extremely tight. Uh, it went into a runoff. So according to the Ukrainian constitution, if none of the candidates uh, wins an absolute majority, uh, there was a runoff election. And that runoff election was uh, perceived as rigged and influenced uh, by, um, by Kuchma and uh, indirectly by, by Russia. Um, and when, when, when it, and despite the fact that exit polls had uh, the, the opposition and Yushchenko, um, a, a, liberal cosmopolitan figure uh, who had 
very much planned for Ukraine to become uh, part of, to, to tighten ties with the EU, um, loosen ties with Russia. Uh, even though the exit polls hit him ahead by 11%, the official results from that runoff um, gave the victor victory to Yanukovych. And that provoked a massive uh, amount of protests and strikes all around uh, Ukraine, but especially in the Western parts of the country. Uh, so uh, this was one of the first times that such massive numbers of people came out to uh, the Maidan of sovereign, the, the square of Indep Independence Square, known popularly as, as the Maidan, and eventually those, uh, as a result of a decision of the Supreme Court, those elections were nullified and a new runoff election was scheduled. And this one was this time uh, won by uh, Yushchenko. There were of course events that you may have may remember from the news with um, Yushchenko being poisoned in the process, but he survived, he became the president. And that was the beginning uh, of this uh, movement of Ukraine towards the, the, the West. And when I say the West, what I mean is um, aspirations to, to uh, tighten ties with the EU, uh, potentially um, uh, join other international organizations identified with the Western hemisphere. Uh, as typically happens in these new fledging democracies uh, that are characterized by turnover of power, uh, Yanukovych did come back to power for, uh, uh, for four years uh, in 2010. Um, this was largely a protest vote against uh, the previously ruling coalition. But what, it, what and what happened towards the end of his rule is um, Ukraine had uh, been planning to sign this document uh, tightening cooperation with the EU. And uh, in the last moment, uh, before the, these documents were supposed to be signed, uh, Yanukovych pulled out and arguably under the influence again of Russia. And this provoked uh, this time uh, massive protests. This, now we're in 2014 um, against um, uh, the, 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 the corrupt government. And uh, this basically started the, the last process of the last eight years that we know of Ukraine very you know, decidedly um, building its sovereignty, building its distance from Russia, trying to become. Um, EU member state, uh, and largely with the cooperation and support of, um, of other EU member states, formerly communist countries, who had now uh, become active members in the EU and very much had in their interest for, for Ukraine to join. So I'm speaking here mainly about Poland, who's always had uh, a lot of cooperation, a lot of trade with, with Ukraine, and of course that trade would be made much easier had Ukraine uh, joined the EU, uh, and this brought us basically to, you know, where we where we are today with uh, with with with, with uh, Russia's Vladimir Putin and an increasingly uh, authoritarian regime being very unhappy with the fact that this uh, this this country that used to be a former republic and that he saw largely as a buffer between himself and the West is now turning to be become Westernized itself. Well, so you've brought us in many ways to just a couple of weeks ago. And what I want to do before we jump into where we are right now is consider the other, I mean, huge variable, the huge piece of this, which is Vladimir Putin. Uh, I mean, you mentioned, Professor Hillis, that, you know, history is not the reason, in your view, um, that we need to understand this is a person's decision. And so I want to put on the table who is Vladimir Putin? What's his background and governance style? And how might understanding him help us to understand what is currently taking place? And I want to hear from both of you, but maybe Professor Hillis, we can start with you on the historical side of that question. Sure. I, I mean, I do think history is very important in understanding and helping us understand who Putin is and where his ideas come from. And I think that when Westerners think and talk about Putin, you often hear them harken back to his experience in the KGB. And the assumption is that he's a kind of arch Soviet figure who's trying to reconstitute the Soviet Union. And I would actually rather point to um, two other historical moments that I think have profoundly shaped his worldview and how he's acting in the current crisis. And those moments are uh, the 19th century imperial experience and then also the experience of the Soviet collapse in the 1990s. So I'll, I'll take both of those briefly. <clears throat> 
Um, I think the ideological repertoire of Putin's program in Ukraine is coming straight out of 19th century imperialist thought. Um, there was an intellectual movement in 19th century Ukraine called the Slavophiles, which was a group, a group that essentially championed Russia's difference from the West, believed that that was a good thing, and believed that Russia had a world historical mission to unite the Slavs. And this realm of thinking um, acknowledges that there may be some small differences between Russians and Ukrainians. It's, it's often um, put in a kind of condescending way that um, Ukrainians' differences are kind of cute or childlike, um, but Russia is the big brother and it preaches essentially that all the Slavs are a single nation. And I think that this is the main precept of Putin's policies that we see today. And so again, I think he does not want to reconstitute the Soviet Union. We've actually heard him being very critical of the Soviet Union in recent speeches. But instead, I think he wants to reconstitute the Russian Empire and its guiding ideologies, which were orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, except now under the, um, under the power of a very sophisticated police state that uses facial recognition and other technologies. Um, the other moment that I think is important in understanding Putin, where he's coming from, and why he continues to enjoy popular support as well is the 1990s. So the 1990s were absolutely devastating for people who lived through this, this time in this region. People lost literally everything. Uh, their economy was stripped for pieces by Western reformers who, you know, came in and, and really flubbed these reforms. Uh, and they also experienced a lot of humiliation on the international stage, going from being citizens of one of the world's two great powers to being a very, you know, minimal, impoverished regional power. And this created deep, deep trauma and psychological despair. And I think we're seeing um, the ramifications of that still today. And so I think this is where the emotional repertoire for Putin and Putinism comes from. Um, this mix of um, perennial victimization and anger and brutality. And Putin emerged to end this chaos. And that, that's why he has remained popular. Um, but he's also consistently channeled these negative emotions and appealed to them. So we'll talk about what comes next in a moment. But I think what's really interesting now is that this man who emerged to end the chaos has now created the greatest chaos that Russia has even seen. Actually, the, the economic contractions we're seeing this week in Russia actually surpass what happened in the 1990s. Um, so the ramifications of that remain to be, be seen, but they will be, um, I think they will be meaningful. Yeah, so I mean, I, I would just add to that, all this is true, I would add to this that, you know, that, that Russia was not the only a country that was seeing uh, the, the the dramatic worsening of uh, economic conditions of regular citizens. I mean, virtually most of the uh, formerly communist states, when they underwent economic market economic reforms, saw this inequality among citizens really really deepen. Um, you know, R Russia had the uh, unfortunate circumstance that. Um, uh, the, the privatization of state-owned enterprises was basically captured by oligarchs that enriched themselves very, very quickly. So there was a little bit of that elite capture of the, the, the wealth that was, was being privatized. Um, but, but I do think that, um, I, I agree that Putin was not a, a, a prominent KGB officer, but I think that that's, you know, that, that's one of the sources of his resentment. I mean, he was very much in the um, in, the, in the process of, of making a career as a KGB man. Um, one of my new projects is, is actually about the secret police in, in Poland and the, the sort of like career stages of, um, you know, officers of the secret police and, you know, and how they start and where they get to. And it seems like with the collapse of the Soviet Union, like his, his career was completely set up on a different trajectory. It's, it's almost as if, you know, somebody who was training to be a professor and got their first tenure track job you know, arrives at a university and suddenly tenure is abolished and academia, as we know, it collapses. So I think he, you know, he harbored a lot of resentment to that moment of the of the of, of the Soviet of Soviet Union's collapse, and he also rose to power on um, very uh, intense criticism of the Yeltsin years, who he saw as weak um, and as you know liberalizing Russia too much. Um, I, th there is also a, a very prominent moment in his political career uh, when he was reminiscing the, you know, the 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 the, um, the victories of Russians during uh, World War II, which in Russia is called Atchaskinnaya Vaina, which means the Patriotic War. It's virtually the only country in the world which calls World War II. Uh, its own patriotic war. So just think about that for a second. So I think that ties into you know his use of 
uh, excuses for what he's doing now as denazification. He's channeling those same sentiments, I think, that you know that have this that, that arouse these very vivid vivid memories. So I don't think he's using um, history, but I think he's using memory politics in a very clever way to uh, to, to get support behind uh, behind his his actions um, at home. And you know, I, I would I would just say that. Um, you know, we, we the eyes of the world are definitely on the, the suffering and the victimization of Ukrainians. But I think that on, what's happening on the other side in, uh, in Russia, which is now becoming increasingly a totalitarian state uh, and a repressive state with, you know, all channels of communication being blocked with the threat of martial law, with the persecution of, you know, any protests and any, um, any questioning or critiques of what Putin is doing, uh, I think our eyes should also turn to what's going to be happening in that country. So can we build on that, uh, Professor Aleppo, because um, I think the question in, in this is hard to tell because we're in the middle, uh, ho hopefully, uh, we're, we're at some stage in this, um, you know, a, a terrible uh, crisis. Um, what does this mean? What, what does this mean for Russia? What does this mean for, for Ukraine? What does this mean for the region? Maybe we can start with you and then, and then come to, to Faith. Yeah, so, so Russia has been uh, what political scientists call a hybrid regime, so definitely not a, you know, complete democracy and, you know, a, a, a regime where, you know, where elections are manipulated, but where the, the, the ruler still um, has a lot of legitimacy with the, with the general public. And, and censorship was actually uh, pretty low compared to, for instance, China. So Russians were using social media, had access to YouTube, um, you know, there the were still independent newspapers. That started changing in the recent years, most notably with uh, the foreign agents law that required any NGO or essentially any organization receiving uh, funding from the West to register as a foreign agent. So, you know, if you're uh, so if you're uh, if you're a university professor who's um, you know working uh, in Russia with an NGO and writing a column, like suddenly you, your your name is uh, associated with a foreign agent, so that's definitely uh, not a pleasant experience at all. But it was but it was definitely sort of on the cusp of you know authoritarian, but like not not all the way. And um, what wars allow rulers to do universally, we know this, is they allow to uh, assert uh, this this role of commander in chief and uh, allow them to really to centralize their role, uh, which is, you know, something that I think Putin has always aspired to do. And even his early reforms of um, demoting uh, governors and demoting uh, and, and withdrawing powers from the regions towards the center uh, has always uh, aspired to do. And what we're seeing now is the gradual uh, increase in, in, in censorship and the, the, the shutting down of civil society. And I think the big question is going to be what is going to happen now with the civil society? Will it try to recreate itself uh, in the form of an underground civil society as, you know, for instance, uh, solidarity did following martial law in Poland during communist rule, or will it recreate itself as a diaspora abroad? I think this is maybe a, uh, something that <laughs> Professor Hill is good could further comment on. But I, I think that's a you know that that is a a question that I've been asking myself a lot lately. And I'll just add, I mean, in a word, this is a disaster for the entire region. Um, we need to remember that in Ukraine, the situation is extremely dire. I mean, I think Ukraine risks basically being um, reduced to rubble as Syria was. We're already seeing thermobaric bombs being used in urban settings. There's extreme food shortages in Kiev and Kharkiv. I mean, it's just an awful, awful um, circumstance. Um, it's also really horrible for Russia too, as, as has already been said, um, to, to make things concrete. There were just new, Putin went on TV this morning announcing that um, anyone who protests is now liable for a five-year five -year jail sentence. Anyone who shares what he calls fake news about the war in Ukraine, which essentially means that it exists, is liable for a 15-year um, war sentence. And also people are liable for conscription, people of military age. And um, I think essentially Russia is already on its way to becoming a pariah state that's cut off from the global economy. Um, there's already shortages. People in Russia cannot get medications they need because of embargoes and things like this. And I think the ultimate question is what that means, right? Um, I think the hope was that these sanctions would 
um, push Putin to a point, uh, to a breaking point, or, you know, create some kind of oligarchic uprising or something to topple him. Um, but I think it's also possible that he feels himself pushed against a wall and gets more and more radical and more and more um, violent. So, you know, that remains to be seen, but um, it's just a disaster for the entire region. Well, so having talked about the region, um, you know, and I know this may feel obvious, um, we are here in the U.S., uh, most people on this webinar are um, identifying as, as American. Um, there's huge humanitarian issues. There's huge regional issues. I just want to make sure we ask the question so we can talk about it. You know, why, in addition to all of those reasons, should Americans care about what's happening? Uh, and, and we can start with either of you on this one. Um, I, I can I can attempt to start. So I mean, this is a, this is potentially a change in the world order as was established following um, following the, the end of World War II, um, and that, you know that is the main reason we should care because the United States was one of the um, the key players in establishing that that world order. Uh, and, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that was a good world order. I mean, I'm um, a citizen of Poland and Poland was, uh, as a result of the Yalta conference, definitely on the losing side of that world order, at least for four for an, for and a half decades. Um, but it, but it, did, um, it did establish sort of a modicum of, of stability. And uh, everything that has started happening since February 21st or 23rd, maybe when the, when the, when the invasion uh, proceeded in the most uh, dramatic form that had been predicted, is showing that, that Putin just doesn't care at all for, that, uh, for the, for the uh, continuity of that world order. Um, now, of course, he's putting the blame on, you know, on the West and on kept promises. Uh, but I think uh, I, I think the the, the the gravity of the situation extends way beyond Ukraine. I mean, there are already over a million refugees uh, in Western Europe uh, in countries that it's not clear that they can accommodate such numbers of refugees. Um, there, there is basically a, a dictator who has gone rogue. Uh, so this is very concerning. Even if we didn't have such large diasporas from uh, from Eastern Europe living in the United States and having, you know, dual citizenship and the potential to to, to, to influence, you know, what happens next. I'll just add to that that I think Americans should care because this this global order, as has already been said, is being renegotiated and. Just to be very concrete about this, I mean, I think a lot of people are hesitant to do things like a no-fly zone because this honestly does risk nuclear war, right? And that is something we all want to avoid. Um, the other side of the coin is that if we want to be risk averse, as I think we should be risk averse to avoid nuclear war, that basically means selling Ukraine down the river. And that's also, I think, very difficult to look at, very difficult to stomach not least because in 1994, when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons that were on its territory when it became independent, the US and Russia made a, a, a pledge of territorial integrity and said that they would protect Ukraine from foreign invasion. So this is just a really difficult moral situation and it's a really difficult practical situation for, for all of us moving forward. And so I think we should care about that quite a lot. Well, so my final question, and then I'm going to turn over to the questions in the Q&A. Um, and Professor Hills, let me just come right back to what you talked about, ways forward. Um, you know, I know this is an impossible question, but what do each of you see as the potential ways forward, if any? Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, I, I was, I was happy this morning to see that apparently there is a, a deconflictualization line that's been established with the Russians and they answered. So there is now diplomatic contact. The sides are talking. I think we need to, um, prioritize humanitarian relief. So there's been some talk of doing a humanitarian no-fly zone in Western Ukraine, where Russia is not really involved in just getting people out who want to get out and getting food and supplies in. Um, and I do think there's still more we could do on the economic side too. For example, um, uh, energy, the energy sector is explicitly excluded from the current US sanctions on Russia and um, Russian gas, is, oil and gas is extremely you know, valuable. We're buying, I think the, the US, EU and um, UK buy something like $770 million a day of Russian commodities. Uh, the question though, again, is, is whether that economic pressure is enough to, um, to push Putin to, to de-escalate. 
Uh, this is a very small thing, but I, I've also um, asked the administrators of this panel to drop some um, some vetted charities in the in the chat as well. So if people are feeling inclined to contribute in that way, um, and I think there's sure to be a massive refugee relief um, project ongoing, and especially in Europe, it's already happening, but hopefully here as well. Um, yeah, I mean all, all of what was what was just said, and I, so I wanted to amplify the the need for. Uh, humanitarian relief and, and hopefully that will happen so so just uh, the ability to uh, to absorb uh, refugees um, coming to Poland, Hungary, uh, Romania, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic is really not enough because so many Ukrainians are just afraid to embark on a trip that involves days of, uh, of queuing at the border so it's really important to have that sort of safe-ish haven in, in Western Ukraine. And I wanted to return to the question with uh, about, you know, oil and gas. I mean, this again puts uh, the U.S. in this precarious situation where in order to not buy gas from Russia, we would have to buy it from other rogue states. The only thing is that they're a little less rogue than Putin right now. So, you, so we basically would have to lift sanctions on Venezuela, Iran, and start trading with Saudi Arabia again. So these are not difficult choices. Again, this is this is a moral dilemma. But then, as the nature of moral dilemmas, um, as as it is with with moral dilemmas, the, there's there's no right choice. There are just like less wrong choices. Uh, first question from the audience: uh, Jean Passarelli uh, asks, given their proximity to Ukraine, we hear very little about the role of countries that buffer: Czech Republic, Poland, Romania. What is the climate viewpoint and activity in those countries regarding the war? And I know we've talked about Poland accepting a lot of refugees, but maybe a broader context yeah. on this. And you know, maybe uh, starting with you, Professor Nalepa, given your expertise in this kind of post-communist citizenship. <laughs> yeah. So no. So this this really uh, touches very close to home because I come from not just Poland but southeastern Poland. So. Um, my part of my family actually is from Lviv. They, Lviv, they, uh, they moved to Krakow um, following World War II. Um, so, what, so the effect this has actually had on Poland is uh, paradoxically uh, positive in the sense that Poland has been ruled by uh, a populist government and has a backsliding uh, authoritarian, re uh, sliding towards authoritarianist regime and has had that regime uh, since 2015. That regime has been pushing uh, independence from the EU, accentuating lifting, uh, Polish sovereignty, um, and it's largely been able to carry a majority of the public uh, with it. Uh, but what the Ukrainian uh, crisis has, un has underscored <laughs> is that uh, proximity to these Western uh, international organizations, EU, NATO is vital for Poland's sovereignty. So suddenly um, attitudes towards the EU have been increasing and just an overwhelming support for uh, refugees from, uh, from Ukraine. And this is largely uh, connected to the fact that there are already uh, 2 million Ukraine, or there were rather 2 million Ukrainians working in Poland before the war, war even started as guest workers. Many of them had acquired residence. Uh, now, uh, I think something like 80,000 of them uh, returned uh, to Ukraine to, to, to fight in the war, while uh, women and children from Ukraine have poured into Poland. But what I've seen on social media is, is just an incredible mobilization of civil society in organizing help uh, for Ukrainians, even among uh, the, the sort of like most money-making yuppie uh, uh, layers of society who have never been involved in charity, they're suddenly, uh, you know, spending most of their working hours organizing help for Ukraine. And that's just very, very heartening. Uh, the first time that the uh, Polish legislature voted um, uh, in a bipartisan uh, fashion uh, in years was uh, to extend um, health benefits and educational benefits to uh, families of refugees who will now be able to stay in Poland for three years, basically. So I think, you know, so it's, it, paradoxically, for now, it's having a very positive effect on those buffering countries where democracy wasn't doing so well. This can be said so much for, for Hungary, where Viktor Orban was blocking the transportation of aid, at least initially, uh, to Ukraine. But but Hungary has also been on that backsliding path a little bit more advanced than Poland. So I think what we're seeing is the strengthening of the EU, um, the, the the tightening of solidarity among EU states. And, you know, just like an appreciation, you know, like what it means when, you know, when you have um, an aspirational empire on Europe's doorstep in the form of Russia. Professor Ellis. Uh, 
I don't have much to add on the Eastern European relief efforts other than that they've been in incredible and very inspiring to watch. But I wanted to point out that there are two other um, sort of buffer issues here and to talk about the ways in which the situation could still escalate. Um, so we have Belarus and Kazakhstan. <laughs> And Belarus has essentially been a Russian client state for a very long time, but it's become even more so. I mean, a lot of this invasion is happening through Belarus. And um, Be both Belarus and Kazakhstan um, are, are also have very tight connections with Russia in terms of remittance economies um, that are now broken because of, of the sanctions. Both countries also have had major protests in the last year. Um, Lukashenko, you know, had these huge, huge protests in, in Belarus directed against him. In Kazakhstan, in January, it's a little less clear what this protest was about. But this is just to say that um, I think that whatever happens in Russia will also have really massive regional um, ramifications in these other two nations as well. Well, speaking of what happens, about half of the questions in the chat, I think, relate to the one I'm going to read from Megan Heckel Greco. Uh, she asks, uh, where do you and or how do you see this conflict war ending, if at all? Much of what I've read is the worst is yet to come in regards to Putin's tactics. And so ominous question, but one I know everyone is asking uh, as historian and political scientists, you know, what are your thoughts? And maybe, uh, Professor Hillis, can we start with you on this one? Well, as a historian, I know better than to make predictions, but I, I, it's hard to sort of predict, you know, exact outcomes, but I, I feel very, very confident saying the worst is yet to come. That is definitely true in Ukraine. As I said, I think Ukraine is pretty much going to be leveled. And I think one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is given that it's now pretty clear, I mean, Putin has said publicly that his goal is to incorporate Ukraine. There are rumors that he wants to install actually this hated ex-president Yanukovych as a public leader. But to what end is, is my question. He's going to inherit an utterly devastated country. His own country is economically devastated and isolated now. So how does that even work? And what is the, what is the end game? I don't know. In terms of what's going to happen in Russia, I think that's the most unpredictable thing. Um, and I think I'll stop there. I don't even want to want to want to gander what will happen, but I think it's also going to be much darker before it gets it better. And it, you know, it may not get better either. Is the other thing to say? I mean, it's it's hard to imagine uh, how long um, Putin can finance this war, and what uh, and maybe finance in the also like broader sense because we've 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 heard from the news and you know and there's plenty of evidence that the m morale of, of his soldiers is simply very very low uh, so eventually you know he's just going to run out of steam to, to 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 hold this this uh this war and this you know and to, to capture cities but at the same time it seems like nothing prevents him from just bombing them and leveling them so the destruction is going to be very vast i think um you know i i, I think you know what we're going to see is you know, the following the, the the massive outflow of refugees, uh, we'll we'll see the reconstitution of you know the Ukrainian diaspora uh, abroad, and you know, and the working of that diaspora from abroad to you know to to plan for uh, independent statehood in in Ukraine. But I don't, I mean, I I really can't see Ukrainian Ukraine coming out of this without you know many scars. I mean, you know, as as a poll, it's very hard to fathom the fate of like a partition state. Um, so, you know, Poland has on numerous occasions been partitioned by neighboring empires. And um, it, you know, it, it seems to be the, you know, the, the minimum for which, you know, Putin will, will, will strive. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to really uh, think. I mean, we're, we're, this is certainly going to last longer. Um, there's, there's no question about that. This is going to be a long drawn out war as, you know, Putin figures out ways to send more soldiers and conscript more boys and trick people to go into the front and fight the war that, you know, for him. Uh, I, I don't think the war is hurting him personally in his dictator, dicta, dictatorship aspirational plans. You know, I think it's allowing him to, to build the, you know, the, the, the terror state that he, that is most convenient for him right now. So there are quite a few questions that have connections to the one I'm about to read uh, from Roman Dumiak. He says, any thoughts on why Putin chose now and not sometime in 2017 to 2020 when NATO was weaker and U.S. was more fractured from a Russian policy perspective? Other questions similar to this ask about, you know, Trump versus Biden to the extent that that might even be a factor here. What are your thoughts on the, 
you know, why exactly now uh, question of this. And um, I, I saw you um, nodding, Professor Nalika, so maybe I can come to you first and then, and then I mean, nodding in the sense that you were, yeah. you know, leaning in to answer, meaning um, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot had to do with the fact that, you know, that when um, the, when, when U.S. was, uh, you know, ruled by by Trump, I think, you know, and it, I, Putin was helping for a second, uh, a second term uh, un, under Trump. So I think when, you know, when it became clear that, you know, like that's not happening and that also like the ability of Russia's meddling in, you know, in, in other Western elections has has been limited. It was kind of one of those now or never moments. And um you know, and I and I think that also what what galvanized this was, you know, were, were Ukraine's uh, EU aspirations and sort of like joining Western organization aspirations. Um, also, there was that moment when it was supposed to happen actually even before the Beijing Olympics, but then, uh, as we seem to know from China, they asked them to not happen before the Olympics. So. Um, you know, but I, I I do think that 2017 was a much less convenient moment just because of where you know where 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 the U.S. was at that time. I'm not sure I can answer that in a satisfactory way because again, the truth is I think we kind of don't we can't really be in his head, right? But I have wondered, um, and there's been a lot of talk about the extent to which this war is also for a domestic audience. So, for example, in Crimea, that. When he went into Crimea in 2014, it was pretty easy. There was relatively little violence. There was a you know protracted war in Donbass, um, but it was pretty popular among the Russian population. And there were sanctions, but they didn't hurt Putin enough. And um, there has been a lot of talk that I've read about sort of like what is happening in inner oligarchic circles. Is Putin sick? Was there some kind of domestic threat? And it, this is only speculation, we can't really answer it, but it is becoming increasingly clear that I think he just thought he would go in, the government would flee, he would take basically Kiev and everything east, if not even more, and that it would be over by now. And I think he's genuinely surprised at, at the sanctions, at Ukrainian resistance, and also at the, the problems the Russian military has had. Um, but that, again, this is really in the realm of speculation. Also, you know, like wars aren't cannot be, uh, you know, prepared uh, overnight. So I, I think it's very likely that this was, you know, in the works and plans much, much earlier, maybe even, you know, 2018, 2019. Um, and, you know, and like they were now ready. So then it was just a, a question of when, when this is going to happen. Izan Shen asks, how should we understand the very different responses among countries worldwide to the Ukraine crisis? And I realize we've talked about the U.S. and Europe, but you were just referencing, Professor Nalepa, what Beijing might have had conversations with Russia. And so maybe we can talk about the other parts of the world and, and what does this mean in your imagination for Russia's relationship with China, with, with some of the other uh, countries that you've named, uh, you know, in the Middle East? Um, how, how will this affect Russia's other relationships? I, I think we've heard about the U.S. and European piece of the story, um, and maybe we can start, uh, Professor Nalepa, with you on that. Yeah, no, it's 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 definitely uh, very telling, especially you know when when it comes to looking at the votes on the um, UN resolution condemning the, the invasion. Uh, so like it was clear that nothing's going to come out of this revolution resolution with uh, you know with Russia having veto power on the Security Council. Uh, so it was it was very largely sort of a declarative statement of you know where, where different countries stand. And uh, I was definitely very surprised by India's, uh, uh, you know, attitude to this. I think, you know, for some of the countries, their decisions was like, well, how would that reflect on, you know, like acts that they themselves have engaged in on, you know, on territories seeking independence on their borders and, and, and so on. Um, with China, kind of China is like Russia's really only chance, uh, but at the same time, uh, China has a, a huge interest in um, global stability uh, for you know for 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 keeping its 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 powerful role wh wh where it is right now. So I so I don't think unpredictable sort of knee jerk reactions by Putin are in any way uh, to their interest. But it seems to be sort of like the natural you know global partner that Russia will be will be turning to uh, to try to evade the, the 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 effect of the sanctions that the West has mounted on it. I don't have much to add to that. Uh, Greg Gosick writes, Russia has basically behaved as an outlaw state, striving to establish its legitimacy as an outsider to the international system on its own terms, 
The one brief exception might be the post-USSR breakup and the flirtation with democracy, a period described by Putin as the greatest disaster in Russian history. Given these deep roots, is there any likelihood post-Putin that Russia can ever depart from its self-aggrandizing tendencies, or is this a perpetual disturbance to which the rest of the world must continue to attend? Look, I, I don't I don't think that countries are destined for democracy or for autocracy. Uh, you know, for one, I think that, you know, whether democracy works as it should, it's it's to a greater extent a function of its institutions um, than, you know, history and culture. It's, it is actually possible to, you know, arrange a constitution, electoral system uh, in a way that, you know, is kind of like full as foolproof as possible. Um, you know, I, I do think that it's, you know, it, it's tricky to imagine uh, like Russia going going that direction right now. But just for context, a lot of countries in the former Soviet region, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but a lot of countries in the former Soviet bloc ha were, were witnessing complete chaos. I mean, I grew up in one of those, you know, countries that was supposed to be a success story. And like, trust me, Warsaw in the 90s didn't look anything like a, a state of, of, of a law and order. Um, and, you, you know, and yet, somehow you know it, it, it survived that that period so i think the, what we have to understand is simply like moments of regime change are moments when where where countries people and society in general are extremely vulnerable and all kinds of things can happen but also beautiful things can happen so uh you know i think we just have to be you know like hopeful that you know once this is over you know there you know i wouldn't i definitely would not cross out the possibilities for russia becoming a democratic state in the future I think I would, I agree, and I would kind of invert the question and say if there's any country that's shown the capacity to turn on a dime, it's Russia, right? So in the imperial regime and in the Soviet regime, there were, of course, many grievances and many problems and many sources of instability, but there's also a lot of inertia. And they were also both powerful police states in which revolution seemed absolutely impossible until the moment it happens. And then once it happens, everyone looks back and under, you know, tries to understand the reasons why and how it happened. Um, but it's all I can say is the situation is extremely volatile. And I mean, again, I think we're both being pessimistic. Um, I think history gives us many reasons to be pessimistic, but certainly, I mean, I think things could also really look very different, not only a year from now, but maybe even a month or two from now in the whole region. So I think you, you have to stay tuned on that. Well, so I'll ask the final question with regret that we can't get to the more than 100 that have been submitted. Um, Clinton Stockwell writes, what I worry about is that the West response to the crisis at this point reminds me a bit of Neville Chamberlain's appeasement policy of the late 1930s versus Hitler. I recognize that we want to avoid a widening conflict, but could the current approach come back to haunt us? And I think this picks up, Professor Hillis, on your point of almost giving away Ukraine to avoid a nuclear war, which on one hand makes sense, but on the other hand leads to all sorts of new questions about, you know, what does this approach look like and what consequence or precedent might this be setting? And so maybe Professor Hillis, we can start with you on this one. Yeah, that is exactly the dilemma that we face. I mean, sadly, we have given away countries in the past. Again, like this happened already in Syria. That's why we know where this is going, right? Um, but I think that, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't have a solution to that question other than to say that is the, the $1 million question. And I'm just hoping that the um, unprecedented nature of all of these challenges may cause someone very smart, smarter than me to think outside the box. But what that, what that solution looks like, I'm just very sorry that I'm unable to proffer. Well, I will, um, and I don't mean to um, you know, embarrass you, uh, Faith, but uh, mention, and we'll put in the chat, a, a really, I thought, insightful article you wrote in The Atlantic uh, just a couple of days ago on, on one potential you know, way to think about this with seizing the oligarch's wealth. So we'll put that in the chat as um, just an additional uh, thought piece for everyone. And uh, President Aleppo, can we end with you on this question? Yeah, no, so this is very uh, an ominous, uh, you know, not, I don't want to say repetition of history, but, you know, uh, the World War II started with the annexation of, of the Sudetenlands and, you know, and then, you know, came the, the rest of 
Czechoslovakia and then Poland and then you know you saw the the domino effect and at, at every corner at every turn it was seemed to think like well maybe he'll stop there maybe he'll stop there so um you know the the the, the when I start making those connections uh you know my, my rational political scientist hat just you know falls off and <laughs> um and it's, it's it's very difficult to to, to to speculate but I will say that I think there's more recognition now that Ukraine is everybody's problem in part because of those commitments that you mentioned early on you know Ukraine did surrender its nuclear arsenal and it was given assurances so it's I think it's very correct now in expecting help this is not the situation you know of uh, Hungary Czechoslovakia and Poland you know under communism where it was very well aware that well the Yalta agreements were signed so really the western west hands are tied uh, but, you know, like now they're, they're not as tight. I think the question is just, you know, like, are we actually willing to incur sanctions that will hurt us personally, right? So, uh, and I think that is, you know, that is the, the, the big question that, you know, that leaders of democratic Western governments have to ask themselves, are they willing to actually inflict costs on their own citizens in order to punish Putin? Well, this has been a sobering conversation, and I just want to thank both of you. I know this is, I mean, especially for people that study the region that have connections to it, a really overwhelming time. Um, your insights, though, are helping all of us to better come to terms. And we often talk at the University of Chicago about how we want to help people on how to think, not what to think. And, you know, this is a conversation that has raised as many questions as it's provided answers, given the very uncertain state. But I think all of us come out of this with better questions and a better way of approaching those questions. And um, as someone who has been closely following this and in that anguish and sorrow that I mentioned earlier, I know I'm deeply grateful for the insight that you've provided and helping me to understand these topics better. Um, thank you all for joining us and uh, obviously a conversation to be continued. Thank you. Thanks for the great questions.